people who are at the cars, you should stay at the cars. It's perfectly okay. They may be more interesting than the talks. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's, not, it's not true that we're auctioning them off. Rod wanted me to clarify that right from the beginning. So we're going to start. My name is Howard Bachner, and um, I'm the host for the day. Um, I'm the editor of uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, and I was uh, appointed in July 2011. And um, th this is kind of a bold experiment um, that Rod Sierra, who's uh, Senior Vice President of Communications, has uh, developed uh, just for this meeting. I want to thank Rod and Catherine Potts, who's in the back. Uh, there's five or six speakers. We're going to talk for about 15 minutes. It's uh, modeled a bit after uh, TED Talks or TED Med. So there'll be themes, there'll be a couple slides, some people have props. Uh, there'll be no questions, the speakers will stay in, uh, until the end. Uh, and I'll introduce each speaker quite briefly though, because I want to make sure they have the time. They're 15 minutes. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is some of the changes at JAMA, what we've done uh, in terms of managing change. And then I'm going to talk about medical education and our healthcare systems. And in each case, I'm going to talk a bit about change of each one of those. I'm going to point out why medical education is stuck. We've been stuck for 50 years, and I will give you one equation to show you why we were stuck. But first, I want to just talk about some of the changes at JAMA and how we've tried to manage change. So, so how do you manage change in a complex situation? The first uh, critical ingredient in change is to have resources. And so after you have resources, the next critical ingredient is to create a vision, a shared vision, among the people who are going to help you change uh, whatever the organization is. And, and then the last is to ensure that you manage risk while you're trying to create that change. So what have we done at JAMA over the last two years? Well, first are these covers. I think many of you who see JAMA know that they come about every two or three months. And um, they've become really quite popular. One of our senior editors has suggested that we open a store called Jamazon so that we can actually sell some of these covers. The other thing we did is a few months ago, we introduced an HTML5 app. It's a little more advanced than most of the apps that you're used to. So you actually download it from the web rather than downloading it uh, either from the Apple Store or from the Google Store. It plays on any device, big or small, round or square. Simultaneously, a few months ago, we renamed all nine of the archives journals. They're now called JAMA Psychiatry, JAMA Pediatrics, JAMA Neurology. And on July 3rd of this year, you will see the first major print redesign of JAMA in over 25 years. It's a bold experiment. And what I always say is, if you like the changes, please email me. And if you don't like the uh, changes, please, please email our publisher, Tom Easley, who's back in the corner. So this is why medical education is stuck. I graduated from medical school in 1979. If people are here who graduated medical school in 1950, 1960, 1970, or 1980, this is the structure of the medical education program that they went through. Four years of undergraduate school, four years of medical school, generally split, two years of uh, basic science education and two years of clinical research, and then three to five years of residency. Unchanged in over six decades. It is very, very hard to argue for progression or change when the structure is immutable. And some of these things are going to have to change in the coming years. I gave a talk at Michigan and we talked about complacency and fear in medical education. And I think I'm particularly pleased that many of you know that the AMA has recognized that we are stuck and over this weekend they will announce the new program about innovation in medical education, and I tip my hat to Jim Madeira, Susan Skolnick, and the AMA for investing in change in medical education. So what might the future look like? C currently, 
evaluation is based on calendar months rather than competencies. Now, what's the struggle with basing it on competencies? We don't know how to measure it, and we're not exactly sure what to measure. Certainly, the six competencies have been articulated. What I struggle with is that somehow they've been created equal. And I would argue being a physician starts with two critical ingredients, professionalism and knowledge. And I do worry as we move from calendar-based evaluation to competency evaluation that we are very, very good at some of the competencies, but not very good at some of the competencies in terms of both measuring them and then understanding if people are progressing. But I was talking to uh, someone who uh, runs a PhD lab, and I asked him, how long do people stay in your PhD lab? How, how long do your PhD students stay in your lab? He said, three years, four years, five years, six years. If you're in sociology or philosophy and have no future, you may stay 10 years. But it's based on competency. It's not based upon calendar years. And I think for the first time in a long time, there's truly a recognition that we have to move away from four years of medical school to more of a competency-based educational program. Why not combine medical school and residency at one program? When I was at Michigan, they have 150 medical students. They have residencies for the hundreds. Why not combine them? Why not combine it into seven years? Why not save the student who leaves debt with $200,000, 50, 60, or $70,000? Again, territoriality in med medical education. Medical schools don't want to give up a year, and certainly residency doesn't want to give up a year. Why not combine residency and fellowship? 80%, 80% of fellows in this country become clinical physicians. They do not do research, they don't remain in academics, but in almost every fellowship, they must do a year to 18 months of research. I would argue that we are confusing service in fellowship with education. If you had a fellow, a previous fellow taking care of you, would you have preferred that they had four years of experience in practice or a year doing research, which they never did again. And so I think, again, combining some of these years in ways that people haven't done before may really be effective. Whenever we used to turn out physicians or pediatricians at the Boston Combined Residency in Pediatrics, and we would turn them over to multi-specialty groups or care programs, they go, well, now their real education begins. And I'll give you one vignette. I was with uh, Mike Marcy, and Michael was a pediatrician in Kaiser in Southern California. And I was at dinner with him and Jerry Klein, who's a, a really a wonderful PDID person, and we were talking about the treatment of children with Kawasaki's disease. And we said um, at uh, Boston Medical Center, well, you know, we had really been able to pare down the admission from five days to three days when they got uh, gamma globulin. And Michael just burst out laughing. Michael said, why do you even admit them to the hospital? What a, what a foolish three days. One, it's expensive. Secondly, it can be unsafe. And it's totally unnecessary. Michael's point was that in the Kaiser system, where they've done such a wonderful job marrying quality with value, with efficiency, they move so many of the services out of the hospital into the ambulatory arena. Why should Kaiser spend years retraining physicians? And so I think in the future, you may see care systems develop their own medical schools and certainly their own residencies. People always say that there's so much to learn, that perhaps people can't be a physician and care for everyone. Michael Porter, a very prominent business person in Harvard, has talked about care models in the outpatient department where they're much more focused, just like they are in the emergency department or in the ambulatory arenas at, acute, uh, at academic medical centers, where care is cohorted. So you have physicians who care for adults with chronic disease. You have teams that care for people with diabetes or congestive heart failure. So 
if that's going to be a possible care system, maybe that's how students and residents need to be educated. Perhaps they don't need to see everything. Perhaps their educational system should be more focused. Medicine has changed over the last 30 years. Infectious diseases have given way to chronic diseases. Mortality and morbidity has plummeted over the last 50 years. The great declines have to do with water, sanitation, vaccination, and other incredible public health measures. The one area where the United States leads the world, leads the world, interestingly enough, is in smoking cessation. But if you talk to people who've been involved in this for many, many years, they talk about still more gains need to be made around smoking cessation. But infectious diseases have given way to chronic diseases. I don't think I need to tell anyone here about the obesity epidemic. Finally flattening at about 40% of the adult population, about a third of the child health population. Congestive heart failure, diabetes, certainly much more pronounced then than ever before. So the infectious diseases of the last 40 or 50 years have given way to chronic diseases. There will be no great clinical gains from devices and therapy. In infectious diseases, in uh, the world of sepsis, in critical care medicine, the rate of death in the intensive care units without any new therapies over two decades has declined by 50%. And that's simply because of supportive and symptomatic care. There are no great breakthroughs around the corner. The great gains in cardiovascular health have slowed. Some people are hopeful of great gains in cancer care as we move from genetic-based care away from organ-based care, but other people are less certain that there'll be great gains. John Ioannidis, a wonderful methodologist, has talked about the inability to find great, care, great gains in devices or medications because the control groups are doing so well. We know precision medicine is arriving. It is very likely that anyone with cancer in a decade will no longer have cancer that's attributable to an organ, but there'll be a genetic profile of that cancer. And the extraordinary news handed down by the Supreme Court yesterday in a nine to zero vote is that the genetic revolution cannot be patented. That's an enormous gain for organized medicine. Big data will enter your lives. I don't know in what format, but it will enter your lives. We've seen articles that suggest that where someone lives, what their health habits are, where they work, should all become part of the, your, of the electronic medical record. The march of technology has no limits. And finally, we really all recognize that care has become patient-centered care. And by patient-centered care, what I really mean is that every clinical decision is bound by societal norms and three intersecting domains, the physician experience, patient expectations, and evidence. And in each of the environments that we take care of patients, these Venn diagrams change. So for acute care medicine, I've never had a patient tell me what they would like me to do. But when you move into the chronic care environment or end of life care, patient expectations, physician experience may become much, much more important than evidence. So what will the future look like? The unit of analysis is no longer gonna be that individual experience between a patient and a doctor. It will change from the patient-centered encounter to a continuum of care. Care will be increasingly delivered in the home, in a car, and at a store. You will be in that Mercedes, you will be in that Dodge Charger, and you will be able to receive care in those environments. I was at UC San Diego. They're working on a device that will be injected into you. It will, it will change or it will check enzymatic changes and it will tell you when you're gonna have a myocardial infarction. That is the future. Every patient will have an individual prognostic and therapeutic fingerprint. It will be embedded in the electronic health record. 
Implanted sensors will detect risk of disease. And the development of teams in the ambulatory environment will mimic the development of teams on the inpatient service. So that unit of analysis, that unit of analysis of an individual physician with an individual patient would become much more elaborate as we develop these teams. Thank you very, very much.